Hi, God bless everyone. So I already did a part one of this video discussing the shift change and biblically showing some scriptures in the Bible. And if I seem a bit hesitant as I talk, it's because my grandbaby is right in back of me sleeping. It's about five in the morning. I'm letting her mama get some rest. So I'm trying to say this <laughs> gently. But anyway, I want to get into this video. So I already discussed several scriptures, but as I stated in that video, I left a lot of the scriptures out. So in this video, I am going to attempt to get some more of those scriptures discussed that's in the Bible about the shift change that's coming. I'm not going to go over them all. I can say that right now. I will not get to them all. So I want to get right into this. So now I'm looking into Isaiah 20. Seven, starting at the first verse in that day. So we know that this is talking about a time in the future in that day. And as I go into this, you'll see that this has not happened. This is the end days. And the Lord has shown me visions of him and how he will be on the earth with his sword. And a lot of us have seen him with his sword recently. Praise God. I would say within yeah, probably within this year, maybe last year, a lot of us have been seeing him with his sword. He will be on this earth with his sword. So anyway, in that day, the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So I've already did a video in the past discussing this a little bit and how I had read this before and I thought that it was spiritual, but I believe that is why the Lord put in here that is in the sea. He says Leviathan is in the sea and I have been shown that there will be dinosaur creatures after the shift change. So this is showing that number one, I wasn't even planning to discuss that, but yeah, this is one is talking about how these creatures would be here in the end days. And I'll put some videos in the description box that I did about Leviathan because the Lord led me to do that. I actually saw Leviathan clear as day. I mean, this was not a dream or a vision. You have to see the video to understand what I'm referring to because I did discuss that. So it says that the Lord will be here with his sword and he showed me that in a vision how he will be here. You guys, oh my goodness. I literally just teared up just right now in one of my eyes, just thinking about how profound it will be. I'm telling you, I wish you guys could see these things as I explain them. But anyway, back to my point, there was this massive, massive, I don't know if you want to call it lair, castle. I mean, it was massive. There is nothing like it. The closest thing I can think to resemble it was in the movie Thor. There was this massive lair, but I'm telling you, you guys, that is no comparison to what Yahweh will have. It is way, way, way bigger than that. And I'm talking about just the walkway alone. You can definitely tell the walkway is made for like giant angels to be able to walk in this walkway. And it was just massive. And Jesus was walking in the walkway and he was so strong, you guys, muscles, strong. He had on this cape, uh, this outfit, his hair was like to his sh shoulders and he was smiling ear to ear. And he was just, he had his sword and he was like, you know, how you kind of show off your sword, like wielding the sword. And he was smiling at me and he let me know telepathically that yes, I will definitely be here in the end days. And he showed me that. Yes, he is. He is going to be here. You guys, I will put that video in the description box and he is going to be a warrior. Oh my goodness. Get the image out of your head of him on the earth the way he was before, because that is not how he's going to look when he returns. <laughs> not at all. I mean, not that he looked bad before, but and let me say this too, the painting that Akiani does, I'm sorry if I'm not saying her name correctly, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but that painting shows how he looked resurrected. And I know that for a fact because God showed me him on the earth 
and he was extremely skinny and I don't want to insult the Lord, but let me just say he did not look like that. Trust me. I mean, he, that was like his resurrected body. That's what he showed us. He showed us his resurrected body. But to my knowledge, I only know of one person besides myself. No, I take that back. I just thought of another person. And some of us have seen him, how he looked when he was on the earth. And I mean, it's the same face and everything, but just imagine if you was real skinny and I don't want to insult the Lord. I'm going to leave it at that. But anyway, even as he looked resurrected as the picture that she drew. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. No, no. mm -mm. Get that out of your mind. God is going to be so handsome, so strong, so many muscles. Oh my goodness. It's mind blowing. Anyway. Yes, he will be here. He will be a superhero on this earth. So I talked about that in my shift change video. And this is just one scripture that um, talks about. And I did say one scripture because there are several scriptures. I don't know if I'm going to get to them in this video or in any other videos. So anyway, the next verse, it says in that day, seeing ye unto her a vineyard of wine. Okay, and I'm going to go on, but I'm going to come back to that. And verse three, I, the Lord do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it day and night. Fury is not in me. Who has set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the world with fruit. So we hear all of these different turns, vineyard. We hear a fruit and this her, who is this her? This her is referring to the church. And I'm going to discuss more of that. And so we hear all these different terminologies. And the Lord began to teach me about this vineyard. And I knew a lot about the vineyard as well, but the things that God taught me in addition to what I already knew was mind blowing. So anyway, I'm going to go right now onto Isaiah five verses one through seven. It says, now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. So it says it's on a very fruitful hill. Planting a vineyard on or near the highest point of any given location will promote better air and water drainage. Air drainage is essential in false and freeze events. And I know these things from things that I've studied. You guys, you can look into it as well. Cold air is heavier than hot air. So it settles in areas of low elevation. The Lord has placed his ministry in an environment in which the saints should be able to grow because there is edible fruit in abundance provided by those hot for God or on fire for Christ. We have sufficient access to the Holy Spirit, the Bible, true ministers of the gospel, godly movies, godly music, God inspired books written by Yahweh's true servants. Through this, we can acquire the fruits of the spirit. Okay. And I'm going to go on verse two and he fenced it. And what does it mean to fence it? He protects us from beasts and demons. Okay. And it says, and he gathered out the stones thereof. Yahweh has removed the stumbling blocks and hindrances that would have eaten up his fruit. So we have a clear access to what we need in order to grow in Christ. And he planted it with the choicest vine. Okay. Jesus Christ is the choicest vine. I actually refer to the Lord as that sometimes when I'm in, in prayer, I'll say the choice is vine because that's who he is. Okay, going on and built a tower in the midst of it. Another name for this tower is watchtower or castle. This tower is a building used for the farmer to watch over the vineyard during the harvest period. So you can look into this. This is why they had towers back in the vineyards in ancient times. And I know in one country, when I was doing my research, they still use a tower to do this. 
and they will stand there and watch over that vineyard, making sure that, you know, it's no beast and things like that. And nowadays, I think they have more cameras doing it. But that's the purpose of this tower in this vineyard, the Lord watching over us, keeping us from demons, you know, praise God. And I discussed in another video before how the Lord has showed me how he was the lion of the tribe of Judah watching over me. And then I've discussed in other videos as well, how he showed me how he had these giant wings, like the shadow of his, it was literally the shadow of his wings. This happened to me too. The clearest day I saw this in my room and he was showing me and I actually saw it before when I was driving too. I never did a video about that, but I did do the video about in my room and his shadow of his wings. He's watching over us. He's watching over us in this tower. Okay. So let me go on and also made a wine press therein. So the fruits we have are tested through pressure, like the type of pressure one encounters when they are faced with an enemy or another challenging situation. So that's what is meant by this wine press. And the tests include, you know, can we remain steadfast in our love for God and others? Can we remain merciful? Do we keep our faith in the Lord in the midst of trials and tribulations? In this journey, we will face pressuring challenges. If we grow bitter during those difficult moments in our lives, we will produce a nasty, bitter wine. If we are all dried up like a raisin, we will produce an infinitesimal amount of wine at most. It is one thing to be a Christian, but if you don't receive constant refreshing from Yahweh, you will dry up just like an unwatered vineyard. Even the most drought tolerant grapevines need regular weekly watering. And you guys, where am I getting this stuff from? You could do your own research. When I researched this, this is what I learned. And it was said that even the most drought tolerant of grapevines need regular weekly watering. As saints, we are weekly refreshed when we celebrate Sabbath. During times of drought, we need more watering because they discussed that as well, how this grapevines need regular weekly watering, but even throughout the week, it could be times of drought and they need to be watered again. And that's what we need. God uses these things in our physical world to explain what we need spiritually. And we need to be constantly connecting to the Lord. So throughout the week, we need to be constantly worshiping the Lord, praying, reading the word of God, periodically fasting, you know, things of this nature to remain refreshed so we can produce a plethora of luscious fruits of the spirit. The Lord wants a close personal relationship with him closer than any other relationship in our lives. If we overcome during the wine press experiences, we will produce new wine, hallelujah, wine that is delicious for the Lord to taste. The new wine is the anointing. The wine press was provided so that we can acquire the anointing as we gain the fruits of the Spirit. So some examples of the anointing displayed include, but are not limited to, these following things. Apostleship which is planning new ministries, developing leaders. It's the leaders of the leaders and the ministers of the ministers. And it also is a high priest anointing. It's a type of high priest anointing. The next one would be prophecy. And next it would be evangelists, which is street preachers. And then we have pastors. Another word for that is priest, teachers, miracles, casting out devils, raising the dead, etc. All of these miracles, gifts of healing, helps, you know, willing to lend a hand, exhortation. A lot of people have that gift, praise God. That is a supernatural gift of the Lord when you exhort someone. Some people have the ability to give someone an exhortation in a way. It is completely supernatural the things that come out of their mouth. And some people also have the gift of helps when they lend a hand and, you know, help people giving, giving to the ministry and uh, things like that. Some people have an actual supernatural gift at that. 
and the next one be governments and governments does not mean Obama does not mean you know um, Biden and Trump it means the church organization and the management of the church those things are considered governments and then lastly diversity of tongues and you can read more about this in 1 Corinthians 12 28 through 31 and Ephesians 4 11 through 14 so we just heard how some people can be operating in these positions with dried up or bitter grapes so what does that mean this is referring to the anointing to have it dried up and bitter grapes so it can mean a lack of the anointing where they're not doing anything you know the anointings of the Lord are without repentance they can still be anointed but they have ceased from releasing anything from that anointing and whether it's preaching or prophecy just going down a list just you know they're not doing anything with it because they're dried up and then they could have bitter grapes and what does that mean you know the Lord had told me and I'm, I don't mind throwing myself under the bus you guys if when it comes to teaching and David did the same thing so I'm gonna discuss myself right now there was a time in my life a recent time this year where I was very negative. I was very much bitter and depressed and I was griping and complaining and I was just murmuring. And I thank God for delivering me from that. Oh, I thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That those times are gone. I give him the glory. But anyway, I did not think I was growing bitter. And then the Lord showed me that I was growing bitter. I did release one video about that. And so what does that mean? When you start getting bitter, yes, you can still be using your anointing and everything like that, but it's getting to the point where the love is leaving, like the love is not there the way that it should be because you want to get out of here. It's like, you know, I want to go home. I've had enough. I'm, I'm sick of this world. And that's how I was feeling like I'm sick of this world. You know, yeah, I need to get this done. So let's just get it done. It affects the ministry. And I thank God, and I'm not going to say I was bitter over a long, long period of time. And I give God the glory for that. And if I was, I would say I was. I, I would honestly say that. But that's not the case. It was a short period of time, and God quickly corrected me on that. And so I thank God for delivering me from that in Jesus' name. But you guys, this is a constant battle. It's a constant battle to stay refreshed, to not get bitter, to not get depressed, and not have a spirit of anger and everything like that. It's a constant battle. And I give God the glory for his assistance and praise God. And so, yes, when you think of a bitter grape, what does that mean? A bitter grape, you put it in your mouth. For me, it's disgusting. Ugh! I instantly want to throw it out throughout the whole cluster of grapes that I purchased. And it's a nasty taste. And you think about what the Lord said about the lukewarm. He said in Revelations, because thou art lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It is a bitter disgusting taste and that is how some people are operating in these hierarchy of the Lord's kingdom they're doing these things supposed to be with their anointing but because of the sin that has entered in it is not sweet it is not tasteful it is disgusting and also I want to discuss that we also have a vineyard now this is the God in heaven truth I have finished this part of the notes and then the Lord showed me a vision. <laughs> I love how he teaches me. This, this is how he teaches me a lot. Let me just explain that. I don't just read the Bible and write a bunch of stuff. I'm going to be honest with you guys. A lot of times the Lord will give me a quick dream. He will give me a quick vision. He will come to me in a, as a, in a vision. Sometimes when I'm working, he will speak to me. He helps me. This is anointing, praise God. Uh, this is how my anointing with him works because I have a teaching anointing. I'm not saying everybody teaching anointing works the same, but this is what he does to me. And I give him the glory for that. And I just want to say that to give him the proper honor in helping me with these things. So anyway, I thought I was done. <laughs> then he showed me a vision of himself with a whole bunch of vines because we talked about how he is the choice vine. He is the, the choicest vine. And so I was like, okay, God, what are you showing me? Why am I seeing you with a whole bunch of, it was like a whole bunch of different vines in back of him. And he was a huge giant and he was smiling with all these vines in back of him. 
And I was like, okay, God, what are you telling me? What does this mean? And he told me what he tells me often. I love how he does me. Look it up in the Bible. (laughs) So I did look it up in the Bible. And I'm not going to go through all of the different scriptures at this time. But basically what I learned is a couple of things that was shocking. And that's that we also have a vineyard. You know, as the church, as men, as individuals, as individuals, we have a our own vineyard. Like in Song of Solomon, she's talked about how she has a vineyard. She says, I have a vineyard and that represents our ministry. Song of Solomon is full of a lot of terminology that is symbolic, but I don't like to use the word symbolic because for some people that word has less power to it, but it's actually more powerful when you think of it in the spiritual terms. So anyway, we have a vineyard, but what was shocking to me that I learned is that the lady in Song of Solomon represents the church and she's telling the male figure of the Song of Solomon how she has a vineyard. And then it says, I'm going to read this, Song of Solomon 8 and 12. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand and those that keep the fruit thereof two hundred. Now the Lord knew I did not understand that. I thought I understood it. I thought, you know, some of this song of Solomon is talking about the Lord. Some of it is talking about Solomon. So that's what I thought. And then the Lord told me as soon as I read this, he spoke to me and told me that's why he showed himself with all of these different vineyards Because he is the Solomon. Now, this is shocking. I'm sorry, you guys. I know it's over some people's head. I have to say what God taught me. He is the Solomon of the Song of Solomon that we're talking about this. And I was like, what? And he told me clear as day, look up the name Solomon. As God in heaven is my witness, I did not look up to the name Solomon until right before I spoke this. (laughs) I had to pause the video to look it up. And the name of Solomon, because I'm just now looking it up. God forgive me, but I'm just now looking it up. And the name Solomon means peace. Hallelujah. And then he also spoke something else to me, which I was shocked by. He told me that he is also called David. And he told me to look up the name David, because that's true, you guys, in the word of God. And I did a video about that in the past already about how the Lord came to me in a vision and the vision said that he was King David. And I showed the scriptures in that video. If I can find that video, I'll put it in the description box. Cause I'm not going to go over all of that right now in the Bible. The scripture showed how the Lord is literally referred to as uh, King David. Now, when it comes to Solomon, it's not as evident. So people don't pick up on it. They just think, you know, that's talking about Solomon, right? But no Solomon's name means peace. And the Lord told me that I was talking about him and the name David means beloved. It means beloved. And we know that Jesus is the beloved son of God. I was really shocked by that, but that is what he taught me. And back to song of Solomon eight and 12, it says that this Solomon, which I believe is the Lord based on what he taught me says that he has, he is saying he must have a thousand vineyards, you know? So anyway, Going back to the scripture, I was reading Isaiah 5, finishing up in verse 2. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Okay, some grapes or, or saints are wild grapes. That means that they're uninhabited, without the Holy Spirit, uncultivated, which means lacking sound doctrine or inhospitable, which means the Holy Spirit can't dwell in them. They're lacking discipline or restraint. So they are led by their own heart and do not obey the Lord's instructions. I pray to God. If you guys are taking notes in this video, that you certainly write that down because I'm going to discuss God's wrath on these wild grapes. Okay. Cause that's coming up. And this is why, because when I discuss it, I'm not going to go over why again, but this is why, you know? So anyway, going on and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah judge, I pray you betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard 
that I have not done in it. So God is saying, you know, he did all he can do. He even died for us. Jesus even died for our sins. What he gave his blood. He literally gave us his blood. What else could he do? That's what he's saying. What else can I do? Okay, going on. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Verse five. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. And it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof. And it shall be trodden down. Okay, I'm going to discuss coming up what that means for it to be trodden down. But first I want to talk about this hedge, okay? The hedge is a barrier. It is like a fence that the Lord has in order to protect his vineyard. So you see like with a vineyard, there's a barrier. There's some type of fence and sometimes it's even made with greenery to protect that vineyard from the outside elements forces and this is what the lord will take away so it's a spiritual protection and we talked about that in the first part about how the lord was removing this gate that's another term for this barrier fence gate he removed this spiritual gate And allowed for the enemy to come in. So this is more confirming scripture of that. So I'm going to go on. Verse 6. And I will lay it waste. So lay it waste means that it will be damaged. The Lord will deliberately destroy the vineyard. Okay, going on. It shall not be pruned. Pruning means to trim. Like the trimming of a tree, a shrub, or a bush. By cutting away dead or overgrown branches or stems, especially to increase fruitfulness and growth. When the Lord does pruning in our lives, that may result in him removing family members, friends, jobs, things we idolize, etc. It can be very painful to lose these people and things. However, the Lord is doing it to help us to reach maximum potential in him. I know that may be hard for many people to hear. It's hard for me to hear you guys. It's hard for me to hear. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, but as a person that has lost loved ones, I've lost friends. It hurts. I know that I am stronger for Christ for the pain that I have endured. Sadly, some people grow bitter towards the Lord and others when the Lord does this pruning process. The wicked will not have to worry about his pruning anymore because the Lord will stop pruning them to reach maximum fruit growth because of their stubborn rebellion against him. Okay, so what I'm showing on the screen right now is a branch in a vineyard that has another branch attached to it. And this other branch that is attached to it is the branch that needs to be cut off. Now, if you look at this image and you say, hey, why does this branch need to be cut off? It looks healthy, just like the other one. It can produce beautiful grapes. What's the big deal? But it's actually growing in the wrong direction for one thing. It's going in the wrong direction. And the grapes that come off of it is not going to match the sweetness, the goodness of the ones coming off that main branch, that thicker branch. And sometimes that thicker branch is the one that has to be cut off because a thicker branch can die. And we know what that (laughs) means. You know, a person is in Christ. They're doing great. They have all this experience because that's what makes it thick. The thickness comes from experience. They've been saved for so long and then they die and then they need to be cut off. And then the new branch grows in its place. So sometimes you have that happening, but you have two healthy looking branches and you need to cut off this one that's going in the wrong direction because if it was going in the right direction, it would be with the main branch, which is headed north. You always want the main branch to be headed straight up because you don't want it growing to the side because then it grows into the other branches and that thick branch with all of that experience every year getting thicker and thicker produces the sweetest fruit 
So that's the choice one that you want. But like I said, sadly, some people, they die. You know, they no longer useful for the ministry. And just think about what's going to happen. Okay, you have this thick branch and you have this one growing. And say you don't want to let go. You, you know, God that wants to come and he wants to prune this person out of your life. And you're like, God, I can't. I cannot. I, I love this person. I cannot let go of this person. And see, that's when rebellion and stubbornness towards the Lord can take place because you don't want to let go of something. And that could be, you know, I'm talking about a person, but that could be anything that the Lord wants to prune out of your life. Praise God. It could be in any type of addiction, any type of idol, something you really don't want to let go. You know, I've seen people even struggle with pop. Seriously. <laughs> some kind of food addiction, whatever. It could be anything. It, be, it could be a person or whatever. And you don't want to let them go. And you look at this big branch and just imagine if it continues to carry this smaller branch. First of all, that smaller branch is growing in the wrong direction. So there are some pull. Now they're trying to pull the main branch into the wrong direction. It's a weight that this thick branch now has to carry with this extra branch on its back. And... On top of that, the branch is growing in the wrong direction, so it can damage the other vines close by. It's not going to be good for the vineyard, and all kind of different problems can start taking place if you don't do that pruning. Giving up part of your crop is a hard thing for any gardener to do. But if you don't prune, the vines produce more grapes than they can fully support. By removing excess canes, you'll let the plant concentrate its energy in the selected canes, which ensues the grapes that are allowed to grow, reach their optimal size and flavor. So you see, if you don't cut this off, it's going to keep the main branch from tasting as good and the grapes from reaching a biggest size and everything else. So removing damaged or diseased plant parts is another important function of pruning. The disadvantage of not pruning enough is that the plants produce a lot of foliage that becomes shade. This limits the plant's ability to set fruit buds for the following year. So you have a lot of foliage growth and then it just becomes a jungle. So if you don't pune and you don't cut these things, let the Lord cut these things out of your life. When it's time for him to cut these people and these things, whatever it is, out of your life. If you don't allow him to do that, the next thing you know, you have this out of control jungle and the whole vineyard is destroyed. And that's unfortunately what will happen as the Lord turns his back on these wicked people. He will stop his pruning process and they think they live in their best life now. But what they really live in the end is a jungle. Okay, the Bible goes on to say, uh, going back to the scripture, and it says that he will not dig it either. It says, nor dig. So digging is needed to get rid of weeds. This is important. Let me discuss this for a second. Because in my research, I came across this one farmer who discussed how you want weeds because it helps to open up the ground for the vineyard. But he said you don't want the weeds to grow too far from the root you want to keep them real low but listen to this you guys he said i love this he said you need them though because it also helps the nutrients for the vineyard it helps the vin vineyard to reach full potential and think about that what are weeds in our lives <laughs> wow that shocked me when I, I saw that because yes we have weeds in our lives we have these people in our lives that hate our living guts and want to see our destruction and you have you know weeds can be the form of demons it can be you know trials and tribulations all of that weeds and you need them because think about it it's our trials and tribulations and these horrible people in our lives that help us to reach our full potential praise god and help us to have our vineyards planted correctly and fully nutrient so anyway back to the scripture so god is saying that he's not going to dig he's not going to Pume, the Bible goes on to say that there shall come up briars and thorns. And the Lord goes on to say, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Now rain has to do with the Lord coming with blessings. Joel 2, through 27. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. 
for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their fruit. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, and the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And then in Hosea 6 and 3 it says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain as the latter and former rain upon the earth. So when the Lord says that he will command the clouds not to rain, as we just saw in Isaiah 5, that is directly speaking of a halt of blessings, the Lord coming with these blessings. Okay, so I'm going to go on back to Isaiah 5, verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So here the Lord establishes that the vineyard represents his people, professing Christians, the church. And we know from the example Jesus gave in Revelation that everyone in the church is not right with the Lord, just as we see here in Isaiah 5. And when I'm referring to Revelation, I'm talking about when God discusses the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyateria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, and it discusses how these churches have their different issues. And I will put, if I don't put it in the description box, I will put a write up in the comment section about the seven churches and just summarizing the issues that they have. So, this is the church, and not everybody in the church is in the church, you know. So, some people have some issues, and that's why. God often refers to his wrath coming on his people, on his church, these professing Christians. Okay, anyway, back to Isaiah 5, going on with that verse. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. So the entire vineyard represents the church, but the plants in the vineyard represent the people individually. And here's the scripture in John 15 and 5, where Jesus is talking and he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abided in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Just ending the scripture in Isaiah 5. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. Okay, so back to the scripture I was talking about previously in Isaiah 27 and 2. It said, in that day, seeing ye unto her. Because I, I discuss all of that to explain Isaiah 27. Amen. And the Lord himself took me on that tangent. He wanted me to explain his vineyard. Because throughout scripture is very important. The Lord discusses his vineyard a lot. So we need to understand these terminologies. He wanted you all to understand it. He wanted me to understand it. Praise God. So anyway, going back to the scripture in Isaiah 27 and 2. And that day seeing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. So what does this mean? The her is referring to the vineyard. The vineyard we just saw is the church, is the ministry. Amen. And Isaiah 5 brings more clarity to the meaning of the vineyard. And specifically when the vineyard consists of wild grapes. Okay, so per understanding a vineyard of red wine, you know, what does that mean? So let's look at this scripture in Genesis 49, 10 through 12. And this is speaking of Jesus. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And Shiloh is Jesus Christ. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. 
And we know that Jesus is the one who will gather the people. It's not Kanye West, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. Binding his foal unto the vine. A foal is a young horse or a related animal. The Bible also refers to the saints as young lions in other scripture. And it refers to Yahweh, Jesus Christ, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And here, let's look at this scripture in Isaiah 31 and 4. It says, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as a lion, and the young lion roaring on his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. So this is telling us point blank how the Lord is referred to as a lion and how we're referred to as young lions. And so here the people are referred to as foals, which is, you know, young horses. Okay, so going back to Genesis 49, and then it says, and his ass is coat. So an ass is an animal in the horse family, but smaller than a horse. This is his coat. So this is a young, uncastrated male horse that is less than four years old. So the Lord is referring to gathering two different types of people. So one is referred to as these young horses, these foals, and then another one is referred to as these asses coats. And it says that they are gathered unto the choice vine. The choice vine is Jesus Christ. And he washeth his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. So from this scripture, we see that the coming of the Lord is associated with red wine. And still going on to understand this red wine, I want to look at Isaiah 63 and Revelation 14, 17 through 20, because in that we see that the wine is associated with Jesus's judgment on the wicked. Isaiah 63 and 3 says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. So, notice that the winepress is trodden. The grapes are crushed with the Lord's feet in anger and fury, this Bible tells us. In Revelation fourteen seventeen through 20, it says, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. And the blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So in this scripture, we see that the wine press is associated with the wrath of God. So in these scriptures, we see two distinctive types of wine. And when I say these scriptures, I'm talking about just all the scriptures I've talked about the vineyard just now. We see that there is a new wine and that's associated with the anointing where the wine press is provided so that we can acquire the anointing as we gain the fruits of the spirit. And then we also see that there is a blood red wine, which is associated with Yahweh's anger, his fury, his wrath, where the wine press is the great wine press of the wrath of God and is provided as a judgment against wickedness. So as true saints of God, the one that we want to get, praise God, is the new wine. Hi, God bless everyone. So I just want to say that this video is long enough as it is so i'm gonna cut it off right here it's a lot more i could have said but i did have a prophetic dream from the lord to make this video so i totally got confirmation i had already made part one and then i had a prophetic dream that i was to make this video i'm just gonna end it here you know what did we talk about in this video we talked about some common things with the shift change in terms of the lord 
upcoming here is many more scriptures about that as well. But the biggest gist of this video was explaining God's vineyard. And I thank God for giving me a dream that I was to release this because I needed that confirmation. This is about the shift change because this is explaining his judgment that is coming. And if you don't understand the different references in the Bible to God's vineyard, then you wouldn't understand his wrath coming on the rebellious people and what that means in terms of them being rebellious and how this wrath is going to hit them. So this is a shift change video. God bless you all. I love you with all my heart. Bye.